Amen. Well, this morning, greetings and uh, welcome to our session. And uh, this is the next installment of our, our subject, which is regarding the kingdom of God. And uh, this has been an amazing journey for me as I begin to, to study the scriptures and begin to ask the Lord to, to show us his mind, his thoughts. And on this journey, we are discovering through the life of Jesus and through the ministry of Jesus, the kingdom of God. Now, the life of Jesus, as we begin to study the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you begin to see a framework. That framework is, is very, very important because in that framework, there's a lot of groundwork that was done through the life and the ministry of Jesus. There was a plan. Uh, there was a scheme and there was a structure that was laid out for us in the scriptures. And like Nintendo said this morning, many times you can read the word of God, but not fully understand. There are times where there are moments where scales, uh, they, they, they drop from your eyes. And you would think to yourself, like I have been doing as uh, I have been studying, that Lord, wow, I'm in church my whole life. Almost five decades of church. And to realize that we love God and serve God, but, but God is, is bringing us to this place where he wants us to live with great understanding. Every one of us, we have to live with understanding. If not, we will just go through re religious patterns and orders, and we think that this is church. We think that this is the plan that God has for our lives, not realizing that God wants us to come up higher. And God wants us to serve him with all that we have, wholeheartedly. God wants us to, to give our lives to him. And so Jesus was sent onto the earth to become the atonement. He came onto the earth because he was going to reconcile us to God the Father. But he was also sent to give us the kingdom. And not just give us the kingdom, but also show us, express this kingdom, this life that God had ordained for us even before the foundations of the earth. And so, like we've been saying religiously now every week, that the word uh, kingdom, the Greek word is a word basilia, which means king, it means a royal domain, uh, it speaks of rulership, uh, it speaks of kingly power, and so all of those things God wants to bestow upon us. God wants to release an anointing upon our lives. But he can't do that if we have not allowed ourselves the, uh, this life that God has want, God imparted into us. This is important. Amen. And so we, we, we've been talking about the process of regeneration. And we were saying that you get saved once, but you're born again repeatedly. Repeatedly, And so we have to go through a process of regeneration, a process of reconfiguration, and a process of reformation. And all of these things have been designed by the Lord to bring us to this powerful place, which is called our sonship or maturity. And so <clears throat> uh, when Christ came onto the earth, he came to establish an invisible kingdom. An invisible kingdom. And Christ was to administrate his kingdom through us. We are his family. We are the body of Christ. The problem is that we have become a people that are weak. Uh, the wine has run out in our lives. We have come to this place where we are overcome by so much of, of, of trials and tribulations and difficulties. How many of you feel like that sometimes? You feel overwhelmed by what you are going through. But... Salvation makes us resilient. It, it gives us an overcoming mentality. It makes us strong. It, 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 it creates a mindset that, that we know we have to walk in dominion. And so we as his church must live from that place. We must function out from that position. And so the issue of the kingdom of God is the, is the king, which is Christ. And that can't change. That is eternal. And they are keys, which is dominion that God has given to us. How I many of you want to walk in dominion? The kingdom is a domain. It's, it's where the location that, that, that the church of God must be found in. 
And so Jesus, this was the gospel that he preached. The first message that he preached was repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And so repentance is to change one's mind. Where we have to reconsider the way we know what church is to be. And so we all have to come to that place of repentance. And so like I've been saying uh, consistently that repentance is not just saying I'm sorry. But coming to this place where you view Christ differently. You view the body of Christ differently. You view the ways of God differently. And so Matthew chapter 10 verse 7, the Bible says, As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He sent out people to preach the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 11, And he said, answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. And so I was saying to you last week when we spoke about the mysteries that certain things are hidden. Not everyone has access to the mystery. Understanding the mystery. It's like how many of you feel sometimes I'm all in the dark? How many of you get upset when, when, when your family discusses something and you don't find out? You say I'm all in the dark. No one likes to be in that position. And very often we put ourselves in that position. And so, and so God wants our eyes opened. We have to remove the veil. Matthew chapter 28, verse 28. But if you, Matthew 12, verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so these are the things that we've been talking about, but I just want to draw your attention to John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus is very clear. And this was just before he could go to the cross of why he came onto the earth. And so when he was asked a question by Pilate, are you a king? Jesus' response was, I am a king. I am a king. Now, don't you think that is significant? Because very often when we view Jesus, we just see him as a Messiah. We see him as a savior. But we don't have perception or sight of him being king. And remember, he was not born in a palace. He was born in a stable. And if you're born in a stable, it doesn't make you a horse. But, but he was a king. He, was, he came from Nazareth, a despised location. A location that has got nothing to offer. In fact, people, when they think of, of, of Nazareth, they say there's one holiday destination we can't go to. Because there's nothing good. There's nothing attractive. There's, there's nothing that stands out in that environment. Why would he choose to be born in that place? Because it proves that location does not define you. And so he says, I am a king. And then he goes on to say, for, for this cause I was born. So there's something locked up in this. And then he says, for this cause I have come into the world. So the kingdom of God is not of this world. And so when the Bible says, do not love the world or the things of the world, for the love of the Father is not in you, it simply means that we who are called his people, his sons don't function out of the cosmos or the arrangement of the world. But we are born from above. We are seated with him in heavenly places. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. 
So it, it takes a mentality, a different kind of a mentality. In John chapter 6, Jesus' ministry was at one of the greatest heights. I mean, can you imagine feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? Can you imagine how popular you, you would be? I mean, people were absolutely mesmerized at the works of God through his life. And so at the height of what he was doing on the earth through his ministry, verse 15 says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, can you imagine at the height of whatever you are doing, when people wanted to exalt you, when people wanted to worship you, when people wanted to create what he did not come for, Jesus did not succumb to that temptation. How many people fail at that hurdle in life where you are at the height of whatever you are doing? And it's so easily to be distracted from your purpose that the kingdom that they wanted to create was an earthly kingdom. A kingdom that you can see, a physical building, a physical throne. And Jesus rejected that because he rejected all of that for one purpose. And that was to sit on your heart. To let his throne be on your heart so that he could rule and govern from that position. Hey, how great are we? Amen. And so... <clears throat> Uh, and so when, when you look at what we spoke about last week, the two types of people, you either live your life by, by being led by the Spirit of God or you live your life by, by the flesh. Now, family, this is your decision. It's your choice. I can't make that decision for you. I can only instruct you in righteousness. I can encourage you. I can give you the word of the Lord. But you have to make the decision. You have to make the decision. And so many of you during this, this series, you will be at a crossroad. Many times you, there will be great offense that will come out of God's word because there are a lot of cliches that go around. Like I said to you uh, when we started the series, many people will use terms like, brother, it's all about the kingdom. Brother, it's for the kingdom without understanding the kingdom of God. And so similarly, how many of you would go to Matthew 6.33, which says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added without understanding what is first. And I can tell you right now that many people that are going to church don't understand that principle. And we don't see the evidence of, of the kingdom of God manifesting in our lives. Amen. Many of us don't have strong devotional lives with the Lord. And yet we will claim, seek first brother. Seek first sister. The kingdom of God is a cliche that we just throw around loosely. We throw around verses loosely without understanding what is God's word saying? Hmm? Without understanding, what is God's word saying? And so, uh, let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. So, the context of Matthew chapter 13, which we spoke about last week, was the issue of people that understand, and uh, rather people that see and hear, and others that don't. Am I right? And so we were, we were talking about the mysteries. And so verse 10 says, and, and, he, and the disciples came to him and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of heaven. But to them it has not been given. And so we, we, we dealt on this last week of how the mystery is a hidden or a secret thing. It's not obvious to the understanding. Although it, when something is explained, you say, wow, it's so easy to understand this. How come I, I did not understand it? And so it's not obvious to the understanding. It is, it is an hidden purpose or, or a secret counsel of God. And so the secret counsels which governs our lives, imagine you don't know how it works. There's no light 
that's shining on this on this mystery. And so we don't want to live from that position. Now the, the Bible is very clear and he's saying to us very clearly, to you it has been given, to them it has not been given. So your entire spiritual life is it, it hinges on a few important things. One is sight. Everyone says sight. You must have sight in the spirit. You must be able to see in the realms of the spirit. So you can't only see with your natural eye. Because a natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit, for it is foolishness to him. So when you hear someone talking spiritual things, because you don't understand it or see it, you dismiss it because you think it's foolishness. No, this is far-fetched. No, no, how can this be? Without realizing that there is an environment where God is speaking, but you can't see it. You can't understand. Somebody is describing something to you, but you are distracted. You are thinking about lunch. You, you, your mind is all over the place. It's, when is this person going to finish now? Because I can't handle it. Can't handle it. How many of you feel like that sometimes? Don't pick your hands up. But why? We can't see. We can't hear spiritually. The Bible says, he who has a ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. Not what the flesh is saying. What the spirit is saying. Very often, we can get offended in church by the message. We can say, hey, you know, pastor is throwing heavy stones. They're like boulders. Pastor does not like me. Pastor does not love me. Not realizing that God is speaking to you. But you take offense to it because you are not able to hear by the Spirit of God. No message should offend you. The message should cut you and bring you to the place of repentance. Where you realize, hey, there's adjustments now I need to go and make. And every time Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and the scribes, they were upset with him. They were angry with him. Their countenance was, was of wanting to murder him because they could not handle the presence of Jesus. Because every time he opened his mouth, it was always against what they were doing, against what they were practicing. And the Lord is saying, hey, to them, it's not been given. And so we behave like a Pharisee and a scribe. Guess what? We'll miss everything that God has for us. And so don't build up a wall. Don't have a resistance. Because it will hinder you seeing what God wants you to see. I mean, verse 16 says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For shortly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it. To hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hmm? I mean, the Lord is He's so clear. Absolutely clear. Now, with that understanding, when we go to verse 18 of the same chapter, the Bible says, therefore, everyone say, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. He's explaining it now. He's explaining it. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, not any word, the word of the kingdom. So how many of you know that the kingdom has a word? Hmm? This is what Jesus preached. This is what Jesus taught. This is what Jesus lived. This is what Jesus demonstrated on the earth. It was the word of the kingdom. And the Bible says, he who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. So, you know, you can be in an environment where the word of the kingdom is being preached and you don't have understanding of that word. Can you imagine how important God's word is? Hmm? How important God's word is? Of how God's word has to become the treasure in our lives. 
Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so your heart has to be connected, joined to the Lord. Amen. Has to be joined to the Lord. Because if it's not, and I will read the scripture shortly, you realize that, hey, you will miss this life that God is talking about. I mean, in James chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? He's asking a question. He's asking a question. And so, there is a position, family, that we have to come to where we function in the wisdom of God. But we have to live with understanding. Amen. The word understanding means to be intelligent. We're talking about spiritual intelligence. So you can be naturally brilliant, but spiritually not sharp. Right? Endured with knowledge. Knowledge. And so it will talk about knowledge of an expert. Do you know that, that, that God is, is granting you grace to become an expert? Hmm? An expert. So, you know, when you look at your life, no one wants to be stagnant. I'm talking about every sphere of life. Just, just, just come out of church for a few minutes. When you take your natural life, how many of you want to be successful? It's normal. It's natural to, to want to live better. Now, when you look at your families and you see their struggles, their difficulties, how many of you also want to Enjoy the same struggle. How many of you want to, to, to struggle through life? How many of you want to be blessed? You see, God delights in, in, in our prosperity. And prosperity is not money, it's fourfold. Every part of our life, we must be blessed. We must be prosperous. This entire series is, is birthed and bringing us to this place where we will walk in the prosperity of God. And prosperity, once again, is fourfold. And so, you can't despise money. How many of you can go to the petrol station and, and say to the Bowser boy, please fill the tank up? Using apostolic words, fill. Hmm? And when he brings the card machine... You say to him, brother, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. That's not going to pay the bill. Hey, Ricardo, don't go try that. You're going to get a hiding. Hmm? You'll be prosecuted. Quoting the scripture is not going to cause you to exist on the earth. You need money. Don't despise money. How many of you wake up one morning and, and you see a deposit of 100,000 rands in your account? But you went to bed sad. You went to bed anxious. And all of a sudden, there's, a, there's some money in your account. Now, let's be honest. I don't care how spiritual you are. Hey? You're going to be excited. You're going to all of a sudden kiss your wife which you don't normally do every morning. Hmm? You'll be excited. You'll be walking around. You'll be singing a song, humming. With just one deposit. Hmm? One deposit. Only if you, when you wake up in the morning and there's a deposit of 100,000 rand in your account and you're upset like, oh, God, why my account? Why not somebody else's account? Hey. Eh? Sometimes people will put money in your account and you say, Lord, hey, you know, thank you so much, but one zero is missing here. <laughs> Somehow this thing is not enough. So I'm saying to us, look, God wants us to prosper. We as kingdom citizens have to be prosperous. Amen. We have to be prosperous. And we look at all the practical things as we go along. But the reality is, if we don't understand the word of the kingdom, we will not be fruitful and productive. So why do you need understanding? So you can be fruitful. So you can be productive. 
not just coming to church and just sitting, but, but, but living this life that expresses the very nature of God. The nature of God is to be generous. How many of you get frustrated because you want to be generous, more generous, exceedingly generous, but you're not in a position to do that? Come on now. How many of you would like to say to me, Pastor, let's just go to Mercedes. We have breakfast. Choose what you want. Eh? See, Joshua has claimed it this morning. Yes, yes class. Right? So, when we, when we look at the word of God, the thing that you need is light. Light will bring illumination and understanding. Because you don't want to be in the dark. You don't want to be in the dark. You can't be blaming ESCOM for the rest of your life. When you have put yourself in that position. Put yourself. In Matthew 6.22, the Bible says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So God has not called us to live from darkness or live in darkness. But he's brought us to this place where he wants us to live in light. Our whole body, every part of us, must live in the light of God. Amen. And so we need light. Say to your neighbor, we need light. We can't live without the light of God's word. Amen. And so if you want to be productive, you've got to desire certain things. You've got to long for certain things. I mean, we have to come to this place where we believe. We believe. The Pastor Ralph made a very powerful statement yesterday. When he said it, I just latched on to it. He said, gifts are given, but fruit is grown. I thought that was so powerful. I thought that was so profound that many of us desire the gifts. And the Bible says you must desire it. Desire it, ask me for it. And I will lavish it upon you because it is his nature to be generous towards us. But fruit is grown. Over a period of time, the fruit of what God has given to us must be seen in our lives. But if we don't believe, if we don't ask, now, when we talk about asking as well, we want to, to get this thing out of our system. You see, you, you, you have to be weaned of certain things. And so, when you take prayer, prayer, how often our prayer is, Lord, and everything about your prayer is about you, your wife, or your husband, or your children, and your cupboards, and your fridge, and your, your safety, and there's nothing wrong in asking God for protection and for provision. But, but, our prayer life cannot revolve only around that. That means you're only worried about what you can get. Right? When are we going to ask God for grace? When are we going to ask God for wisdom? When are we going to ask God for discernment? When are we going to, to say to God that I thirst after you? I, 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 there's this deep desire that I have within me for you. Now, we have to start praying those prayers. This longing, this desiring for God, for his presence, for his word. How many of you would like to read the Bible and, and you see it in a brand new light altogether? Hmm? That while you are sitting, while you are sitting, all of a sudden, there's this, there's this thought that comes into your spirit. And you realize that hey, this is only God that dropped it. Because we're wanting to change, but if you don't receive understanding with the word of the kingdom, you can't change. And if there's no light, you can't change. It's not possible because then you're trying to change on your own strength. You trying to change. Many things in my life I wanted to give up. And I realized I could not give it up. Why? 
although you are praying, you will do certain things, but, but, but there are times where you're trying to do it using your own willpower. Trying to do it using your own strength. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled. Come on, how many of you want to be filled? Hmm? How many of you want to experience the infilling? Experience an overflow in your life. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger. If I ask you this morning, what are you hungry for? What, what, what is your desire? What is your thirst? What is your thirst? And this hunger and this desire is for Christ. Christ wanting to be in the manifest presence of God. Amen. Now, if we don't come to that place in our lives, if we don't come to that desire in our lives, family, we'll miss this thing. We'll miss it. I can't, I wish I could click my finger and it just happens for you. No, it doesn't. Each man has his own journey in Christ. Amen. There has to be a turning point. There has to be a point where, where in your life there is such a, a movement towards him and his purpose. And let me say to you, myself being in church for 20 years that I've done every religious practice and I've done it without knowing God. Without knowing God. You can be in church because you have to be in church. You can go to, to certain meetings because you have to go to certain meetings. But you're just attending. But you've not experienced God. You've not desired God. And see, when you have that moment, you have to seize it. You have to seize it. I mean, Somi is talking about his life and how he was led astray, but how he had this moment where he received the Lord Jesus Christ. And from the time he received that infilling that came into his life, he's never turned back. I mean, I used to sit with these boys on a Friday afternoon for two hours talking about the word. There was no tricks. There was no gimmicks. Whether there was two people or there were 20 people, we did not deviate from the, from, from the pathway. Sometimes we never had a classroom. We should sit under a tree, sit on benches. But people will desire the word of the kingdom. And guess what? God gave them light. God gave them light. And so what do you desire this morning? What are you longing for? Because see, you can be on this journey, like in Acts chapter 8. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. So this guy is, is busy reading God's word. You've got to hear me very carefully this morning. He's reading God's word. He's not reading mills and boons. He's not reading a magazine. Come on, he's reading God's word. God's word. And Philip asked him a question. Do you understand what you are reading? How's that? Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I? Unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So, there's he reading God's word, reading the, the prophet Isaiah and what a book he chose. That's a heavy book. 66 uh, chapters. Reading without understanding. Hmm? Reading without understanding. And there the Lord now, uh, there Philip is saying to him, are you reading with understanding? And he says, how can I unless someone guides me? Right? Unless someone guides me. Look, number one is he acknowledges he needs someone. He needs someone. But there's something I want you to think about for the rest of your life. Don't allow these words to escape you. Hmm? The Bible says, and he asked. You know that you have to break all forms of, of pride. Eh? He asked. In other words, he came to this place where he, he realized, hey, I, uh, please come and show me. 
Come and explain to me. Come and give me understanding. Come and open up the scriptures to me. Help me to see in a certain way. Amen. Come and sit with me. Come up. You see, family, if you don't open the door of your heart, nothing is going to happen. That's why Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. How many of you are responding to God opening the door? Hmm. How many of you are responding to God opening the door? And so we have to come to this place of, 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 of saying, Lord, come in. Because the Bible is saying, and I will dine with you. What is that? I want to, I want to open up the scriptures to you. That's what dine is. Dine is not uh, a romantic evening. Uh, we have a carnal perception of what dine, uh, to dine with one is. The Lord is not looking for a date. I'm not an American pastor that's trying to impress you. No, no, he wants to break bread with you. So that he only can come out of the scriptures. Amen. There's such a powerful scripture in, in John chapter 5. I think it's the last verse. You can, you can find it and read it. But Jesus is, is talking to these people and he's, he's lambasting it. Maybe Josh can put it up quickly. Joshua 5, I think it's the, the, the last two verses, where he's, he's saying now to, to, to these people, and, and he's talking to them, obviously, with, with concerning the, the word of the Lord. Now, when we, when we come back to the word of the Lord, how you respond to God's word is very important. How you react to God's word is very important. So, it says here, for if you believe Moses, would you believe me? For he wrote about me. Hmm? But if you do not believe these writings, how will you believe my words? That means everything is about Christ. Everything. He wrote about me. Every law is about Christ. Everything is about Christ. And this is what I love about the series here is that everything comes back to one person and one person only is Christ. Him we preach. Amen. Him we preach. So, if you don't have understanding, it's going to affect your fruitfulness and your productivity in the kingdom of God. Hmm? You see, you may just look at your life now and you say, hey, you know, I'm here and uh, I don't know what my purpose is, what my plan is, or God's plan for my life. Look, you can be like that for the rest of your life. Or you can decide to change the trajectory of your spiritual life. Amen. I mean, if you've been out with someone and the food is served, but they're upset, angry, you had an argument. The argument is about... I don't know. What, what, what people argue about? My wife and I, when we go to eat, we eat. We don't play games. Very upset or not upset. Right? Some people don't eat because they're angry. It's like, like, like Anna that would go to the temple and she's so upset because uh, this, this, this one got and I don't have. Now, this one is provoking me and I'm upset about it. And, and, and uh, you can be in the temple but not eat and drink. Hmm? Not, not dine. And so, you have to fulfill your purpose in Christ. And so when you read that, that entire parable, and, 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 and Matthew 13 is actually the parable of all parables. That means everything is locked up in what we're talking about right now. If we don't understand this, you, you can forget it. You can forget it. Now, in Exodus 31 verse 3, when you, when you look at the Lord, one of the things he wanted to do was he wanted to be with his people. Why did he send Christ? He sent Christ so that we could be in, in, in consistent fellowship with him. Consistently communicating with him. Consistently receiving from him. Amen. Now, 
That's the relationship that God wants with us. That's why if you read Revelation 21, it says, I tabernacle among you. When you go to uh, John 14, it says, and we will come and make our home, our abode, make you our dwelling place. That's why Christ came onto the earth. Now, once again, we can quote verses as cliches, like, like 1 Corinthians 3.16, that says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? But do we understand that we are God's temple? Do we understand that your heart is God's throne? It's a place where he sits on. I don't think God sits somewhere so far away and it's God. Uh, don't make heaven in the image of earth. You are truly God's special treasure. He has chosen you before the foundations of the earth. Right? So maybe you made some mistakes. Maybe you made some errors in life. Maybe you took some detours. Maybe you've done some stuff. But hey, God that we know is merciful and gracious is waiting for you to turn. God is not holding it against you. You are holding it against yourself. And so in Exodus 31, he was wanting now to, to establish his presence with his people. His presence with his people. That, that's, that was his objective. That's what he wanted to do. But there was a way to do it. It wouldn't just happen. And sometimes in our lives we don't realize. We're just waiting for things to happen. Not realizing that, that God is crafting something. There's a way in which he crafts it. And we need understanding and light to know how it's done. So don't wait. It, it's like a person now that, that is consistently... Uh, you know, mismanaging his life and his diet, but he wants prayer. Right? You have opened the door for demons to come in. You have opened the door for certain things to happen in your life. Right? And you want one prayer now that's going to bail you out. And God is saying, sort it out. Sort it out. You can't complain and say, God, but why the snake is in my yard? Uh, when your yard has got rubble, it's got, it's got all kinds of things that are not supposed to be there, of course you're going to attra attract snakes. So when you see the snake, don't get frightened, don't get shocked. Say, good morning. What took you so long? Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So, Jesus wanted to be with these people. And so, in, in chapter 31, he chose two men to represent him. Right? And maybe at a later date we can go through the names, Basilia and Iolab. Or Yolab. If the, if the A is silent, if I'm pronouncing it, you must know the H is also silent. So the, the word really takes on a brand new, brand new meaning. But, but busy L means shadow. Shadow. Under the shadow of the almighty God. How many of you like Psalm 91? How many of you want to put a uh, bumper sticker Psalm 91 or protected by Psalm 91? Now, so the Lord chose these two men. Right? Look at verse 3. It says, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Everyone say the Spirit of God. You see, God wants to fill you with His Spirit. Hmm? What's the plan of God here? He wants to be with His people. Why did God save you? Why did God bring you into the kingdom of God? What is God's purpose for your life? Uh, th the biggest question that people always want answers to is, what is the will of God? People say to me, Pastor, what is the will of God for my life? How many of you would like to know the answer to that question? Depends which day you ask me the question. Because if you had to ask me that question this morning, I would say to you, the will of, uh, the will of God for your life is to give me a million rands. Hmm? Belinda, say amen. I'll give you a voucher to Nando's. Now, 
the will of God for your life. Don't forget this. Because the will of God for, for my life and your life can't be different. Am I right? We may have different purposes on the earth and function in a certain different way and we have a different grace configuration, different measures of anointing, but we are all the sons of God. And because we are all the sons of God, God's will for our life is to represent God the Father on the earth. Very simple. Very simple. You can't represent God the Father on the earth without the Spirit of God. You can't represent God the Father without wisdom. You can't rep and wisdom is wisdom from above. You can't represent God without understanding. You can't represent God without knowledge. God wants to fill you with that. Amen. So everywhere you go, guess what? Guess what? God visits his people through you. Hey, what an assignment you got. Hmm? What an assignment you got. Exodus 35, 31, and he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. Can you see the consistency? Exodus 36, 1. And every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary and shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. Hmm? How's that? So can you see why you need understanding? Because if you don't understand the word of the kingdom, you will be fruitless. You will be productive less. No one likes less. Yeah? People want more. So, so when you begin to look at God wanting to be with his people, tabernacle with his people, and remember the Ark of the Covenant was a place where God would speak from. Hmm? The foundation of the Ark of the Covenant was his word. Look at God in all his wisdom, how, how he would uh, put wisdom in them for, it, for them to make it in such a way. You know that you, you take the Ark of the Covenant and you align it to your life because everything about the Ark points to Christ. Everything about it points to Christ. That the mercy seat and the cherubims and, and, and the Shekinah glory of God that, that will now begin to flow out of this place. But without the wisdom and understanding of God, you can't build it. It can't be established. Now when you go to the when you look at Jesus at the tomb, <clears throat> and as he, he laid in the tomb, there are two angels that went on either side, one at the head and the other at the feet. And we know that angels are, 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 are pictures of the, of the cherubims that we, that we read about here in Exodus 36. That, that entire image was now fulfilled in Christ. In Christ. And it was fulfilled so that we could function in the kingdom that he has given to us. Amen. And so, this is, is, is very, very important for our lives. Now, if you don't love God's word, guess what? This thing is not for you. Not for you. Don't get upset with me. You go read John 14 for yourself. Amen. Go read John 14 for yourself. Now, when you take the life of David, David, you'd notice that David had an extreme abundant love for God in his word. He treasured it. Loved it. Loved it. Why would a person come to that place? Because you know, I'm preaching now for 25 years. And I've been to many parts of the world. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Lord, why do people struggle to love your word? You call it, we call ourselves Christians. But we have not had encounters with God's word. It's boring. It's, it's tiring. Hey, everyone gets tired. I get tired as well. I've been to schools where the person is preaching for one hour, 20 minutes. 
And if you all don't start smiling now, I have all the authority in this place to also speak for one hour, 20 minutes. Hmm? The Bible says you do greater things. Then we go beyond the apostles that are we listening to. You have to pinch yourself. You have to carry sweets to keep yourself awake. But there's a download. And the download sometimes takes you three, four years to understand and work out in your life. But it was God. It was God. And so when you take David, David has such a love for the presence of God, such a love for the word of God. I mean, his commitment levels were at, at a different level. Every person wants that David in their church. For you know that the sheep are well taken care of. <laughs> Excuse me, give up his life for the sheep. Hmm? That you know when, when, when the lion is there or the bear is there, whatever comes, that, that, that he would now automatically, automatically, Take care of it. Uh, when you say to, to David, run. You know, asking you, Pastor, where are you sending me? Send Panash. Hmm? Send Joseph. Now look at how he takes instructions. Look at how he comes into the, uh, into the perfect will of God. How he represents the power of God to an entire nation. What is the key? The love for God's word. But when you go to Psalms 119, verses 130, the Bible says, the entrance of your words gives light. Entrance of your words give light. How are you going to receive this light? Hmm? See, when these words enter your heart, it will bring light. There's no tricks that can give you light. No, no, no tricks. You can have the most powerful band in the world here. They can't give you anything. Anything. Because look at the two walking on the road to Emmaus. All they receive light. Jesus didn't ask him to bring a band and come. He yeah, need an environment. No, he just sat and spoke to them. But the entrance of those words brings light. Listen to this. It gives understanding to the simple. How many of you know you are the simple? I am the simple. So, if the entrance of your words don't give light, guess what? No understanding. That means it's just a message. It's just something that you heard. It says, I opened my mouth and panted. For I longed for your commandments. Look upon me and be merciful to me. As your custom is towards those who love your name. Direct my steps by your word. And let no iniquity have dominion over me. Hey, this, this is a powerful. In fact, we can close the meeting and go home now. But because you didn't smile for much of my message, I'm going to go for it. Right? I opened my mouth and panted. I longed for your commandments. Hey, look here. You've got to come to church with this attitude. You've got to come to the house of God, not for any other thing but for the word of God. Hmm? You have to say, Lord, this morning I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to pant because I need this. I am longing for your word. This is what I love. This is what I desire. Amen. He's saying, yeah, look upon me and be merciful. That means, Lord, don't hide this from me anymore. Don't hide it. Give me light. Give me understanding. I'm tired of living in the dark. Amen. He said, and as your custom is towards those who love your name. Hey, God wants to unveil himself to you. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Psalms 119 verse 34. It says, give me understanding. And I shall keep your law. That means you without understanding, you can't keep God's word. 
Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart and make me walk in the paths of your commandments, your word. For I delight in it. What does he delight in? Delights in walking in God's word, not just hearing God's word. Walking in God's word. Say amen. Give me understanding. There's a man that has achieved so much in life. What is his prayer? Give me understanding. Give me understanding. Now, in Psalms 119, verse 73, it says, Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Hey, how's that? Those who fear you will be glad when they shall see me, because I have hoped in your word. Hmm? Now, Psalms 119 is David's prayer. This is what he's longing for, desiring. What are we desiring this morning? Psalms 119, verse 104. It says, through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You see, you can't hate for the false way if you don't get understanding from God's word. See, many people only quote verse 105. How many of you know verse 105? Your word is a... Say it, say it loud. Your word is a... To my feet. A light to my path. We all know this verse. How many of you like to quote it? It's good to quote it. But... If we don't understand the, 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 the verse that is before that, where it says, through your word, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You can't walk in both roads. You have to choose one road. You can't have one leg here and one leg there. Come on now. Huh? Right? So, look at David. Look at his desire. Look at what he's longing for. Hmm? Look at what he's longing for. Look at what he's desiring. This deep, it's coming from deep within him. Deep within him. This morning, what is your cry deep within you? Amen. I want to say to some of you this morning that God wants to rearrange your life. He wants to reorder it. He wants to reorientate you. God wants to bring reformation into your life and into your heart. Amen. And you're going to notice over the next six months extraordinary things beginning to happen. But you've got to listen to what I'm saying very, very carefully and clearly. That when you leave this place, leave like David would cry out to the Lord. Amen. And let me say to you, riches will come to you. Wealth will come to you. Good health will come to you. A lot of things you desire will come to you. Amen. Amen. God is not a man that he should lie. His word can't fail. The word can't return void. If he says, and all these things shall be added to you, why won't he give it to you? Come on now. Some of you are going to experience the absolute supernatural in your life. The problem is we've, we've, we've had so much of pressure and so much of stress and, and things taking place where the supernatural has not been activated. Amen. The supernatural has not been activated. And so when we talk about the supernatural, something wrong with the sound? Sound one, two. When we, when we talk about the, the, the supernatural, how many of you want to experience it? Amen. So, you must open the door. Say, Lord, come. Come. Right? When we talk about the supernatural, you're going to see how your debt can get paid off overnight. Hmm? Where the Lord will give you things that you, you, your mind can't even fathom. Mark my words. Provided you open the door first. Maybe you are trusting God for something. Maybe you are seeking the face of God for something. 
Hmm? Let me say it to you. God will give it to you. God will give you. Don't box God because of how your life is and where your circumstances are right now. Don't box him. God can't be boxed. Not the God that we know. Not the God that we serve. Amen. Too many testimonies to give to you this morning. Many, many times. Many, many, many times. God did extraordinary things for us. Many times. And, and let me say to you, God will do the same for you. Amen. When I opened my life to the Lord, I never turned back. No circumstance, no situation on the earth caused me to curse God or caused me to take my eyes off the Lord. Hmm? We pushed on. We pushed through. Pushed through. God can do it for you. God can do it for you. Maybe you're trusting God for something. Let me say to you, anything can happen. Is there anything too hard for my Lord? Sarah was gone past the age of childbearing. She was, she was old. Old. What did God wait for? God waited for her to go past the age of childbearing. So that he could work. This morning, take away your pen and paper and how you're trying to work things out and plan things. It's not going to work that way. Now you have to leave the boat and walk on the water. You have to take risk with God. Hmm? You have to trust Him like you've never trusted Him before. Right? So, let me conclude with this this morning. I'm saying to you, right now, many of you don't have a relationship with God. Many of you, God is knocking on your door. But there's a resistance and the resistance is coming from you. Right? We can't beat around the bush anymore. God is waiting for you. Many of you have not experienced the love of God in a long time. You're living a life, you are isolated, you're trying and you're pushing, but you're doing it by the sweat of your brow. You're not doing it from him. And if you want times of refreshing, if you want to, to see visitations of God in your life, open the door. Open the door. Amen. How many of you are willing to do that? How many of you are willing to do that? Some of you are holding on to the past. Got to let go of the past. What's done is done, no? You can't change it. Can't change it. Yes, maybe restitution can be made. But the reality is, you have to move forward. You have to move forward. You have to come to this place where you say, Lord, it's you I want. It's you I desire. It's you I long for. Today I open my mouth and I pant. I pant. That's my desire. That's my desire. How many of you are really excited? Stand, stand to your feet as we close this morning.